We're glad to continue our topical series through uh, a number of topics that we've picked out for the summertime for about seven or eight weeks here. Uh, last time we talked about the Holy Spirit, the present ministry of the Holy Spirit. This morning we're going to talk about spiritual leadership, spiritual influence, you might say, if you wanted to use a different word. But we're going to mainly be taking as our cue the book of Joshua. We're going to be bringing our points and the theology that will develop around this topic from the book of Joshua, a number of selected passages from that book. So today we're going to talk about how to be a strong and courageous spiritual leader. And that rises from humility and faith. Those are essential things. The spiritual leader takes ground for the kingdom of God and inspires and leads others to do the same. And so again, we're going to be looking at the life of Joshua and a number of things that are said to Joshua by the Lord to talk about that. But in the scriptures, when you're, when you're looking at leadership, there's sort of a twofold application. One, it does talk about officers and those other perhaps positions in life where God has put somebody in a position of authority. So a position of authority could be a church leader, a leader in the home, uh, you know, the husband, the government official, the employer, right? But we specifically want to talk about spiritual influence. And as such, that actually applies to every single person. You know, I've said before, and we continue to say here at GPC, that we want every single man, woman, and child to be a leader in that they are influencing others to grow closer to Christ. Influencing others to grow closer to Christ. There's so many different parts of the Bible <laughs> that give this to us as our daily ration in ministry, so to speak, uh, as something that we ought to be doing. I, I wouldn't even know where to start if, uh, if you disagreed with me on that. Um, exhort one another daily, you know. Uh, bear one another's burdens. There's so many calls in Scripture to do ministry to one another and to the, to the other people that are in your life and to push them or to pull them <laughs> closer to the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's a, that's a mandate from Scripture that is upon every single believer to influence others for the sake of Christ. Again, some in ordained positions and specific positions of authority, others more generally, but it applies to each and every one of us. So if you don't consider yourself a leader by personality or in a leadership position, there's still that call to spiritually influence others to lead them closer to Christ. And so there's something that is there for everybody. I want you to envision the leader of a troops, the, the captain of an army. Let's take medieval times, for example. And he's leading the troops, and he rides out on his horse out in front of all the troops to meet the enemy, right? And at that particular point in the battle scene, right? You've probably seen this scene in movies many times, right? You know, all the troops have a split-second decision to be made in that moment, you know? Are they going to follow the leader into battle, into the fray, or are they going to hang back and not do that and say, oh, this is, this is stupid, we should not do that? There's a split-second decision, and if the troops love and care for and trust that leader and believe in the vision that he stands for, etc., they're going to do something, which is they're going to also take off on their horses, right? And the goal is to outride the leader, <laughs> Because if the leader makes it to the other enemy forces by himself, uh, he's going to be the first one killed, and there's going to be nobody around him, right? <laughs> so they have to actually outride that leader who's leading the charge and make it to the enemy lines before he does. And that was the point of that brave move of riding out first, right? To inspire others to do the same. And that is something that you see in the history of Christianity. Taking, <laughs> you know, there, there, there was a... There was a elder in Uganda who had started a school and he had a successful business and uh, he, was a, he was a Christian man and the theme of the school that he started, uh, it, he was in the, in the Presbyterian Church in Uganda, when you, when you drove up to their school compound, there was a big sign that had the theme of their school and the theme of their school was taking the bull by the horns, which I, thought, I always thought was a little bit funny, but but it, I mean, it kind of illustrates this point, right? That's, that's what they're training leaders to do, is to step into the fray, to take things uh, under charge and to go for it. Um, and that's something that we want people to do here at GPC, is to take initiative, to take initiative. And I hope that the, 
the ordained leadership of this church is empowering you to take initiative for the kingdom of God, not just to be a passive uh, sitter in the pew, so to speak, um, but to take initiative for the kingdom of God. John Knox, the fiery Scottish reformer, said in his History of the Reformation in Scotland, these couple quotes. He said, I will keep the ground that God has given me, and perhaps in His grace, He will ignite me again, he said at one point in his career. But ignite me or not, in His grace, in His power, I will hold the ground. And he also said, give me Scotland, else I die, as he was working for Reformation there. The gospel to have success the kingdom of God to take over that place, right? Give me Scotland outside die. Give me Utah outside die. That's the kind of initiative that we want to see in people because the Lord is at work. And so we're going to talk about where that comes from, what it looks like, where it ends up, that kind of thing. First, spiritual, leader, spiritual leadership arises from two things, humility and faith, humility and faith. And for this, we'll look at Joshua chapter 5. Now, when Joshua was near Jericho, verse 13, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and asked, Are you for us or for our enemies? Neither, he replied. But as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Then Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked him, What message does my Lord have? For his servant. The commander of the Lord's army replied, Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Snapshot of the historical moment in the history of redemption here. The premier salvation event in the Old Testament is the exodus of God's people out of Israel into the promised land, led by first Moses. But he sins, and so he leads them up to the promised land, but not into the promised land. There's a transition in leadership that happens where God says, now your aid, your right-hand man, Joshua, is going to take them into the promised land, right? So there is a critical transfer of leadership that happens. And that's why you get all these lessons in Joshua because it is such a critical moment in the history of salvation. You know, are they actually going to make it into the promised land or are all God's promises that he made going to fail. There was even prophecies beforehand. The, bro- the bones of Joseph were going to go up out of Egypt and go back to the promised land that had been promised to Abraham, right? They were going to be in slavery 400 years and then be let out. There were so many promises that had to be fulfilled. Were all these going to come to nothing or was the plan of God going to go forward? It was, but it was through God's ordained means, leaders. And so he's commissioning Joshua to take this task for. We're going to go back to Joshua 1 in a minute. But this is a scene where Joshua has begun to have some success. He's begun to lead the campaign. He's the commander of all the forces of Israel. (laughs) But this, this commander of the forces of Israel is about to meet the commander of the forces of the universe, the God Almighty. I would take this as a pre incarnate appearance of Christ Jesus himself. Uh, The angels typically don't say to people, take off your sandals. So he meets God in this moment. He is in the presence of holiness, just like Moses was at the burning bush, where God just said to him through the burning bush, take off your sandals for the ground that you are standing on is holy ground. It is this holy encounter which leads him to do what? (laughs) To get on his face, to get on his knees before the Lord, right? That's, That's exactly what he does. It says, then Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence. There was a humility there that overwhelmed him in the place of holiness. And it's that encounter with God that anything has to start with in terms of Spiritual leadership. If you're going to influence someone else for Christ, you have to have that kind of holy encounter where you are utterly humbled and you then believe. The faith arises from that moment. He asks God, what message does my Lord have for his servant? (laughs) 
He's ready and willing in faith to receive, and, he, and the Lord does guide him and will guide him. You can read the whole story in the book of Joshua. It's beautiful, wonderful to meditate on this afternoon. He will lead him. He will guide him, but it begins with humility and faith. That's the starting place of spiritual leadership. Unless you've had that encounter with God that has left you deeply humbled, and above all things now you believe the Lord, you won't get anywhere. Joshua fell face down in humility. Moses took off his sandals and said he couldn't speak well. He was self-deprecating. Without humility, you'll get nowhere with people. But without faith, you won't be able to take anyone anywhere. (laughs) You see that? See, without humility, (laughs) you know, toward others in your life, right? They won't want to follow you, (laughs) you know? They they don't want to follow someone who who, who is prideful who is full of themselves, who is doing it for their own glory, right? There must be that humility that says, I am a sinner. (laughs) What does Paul call himself? The chief of sinners. (laughs) He says, I can't can't even believe I'm doing this apostle stuff here because I was throwing believers in prison. I was the chief of sinners. Even now I still struggle. I had the thorn in the flesh. But God has chosen in His grace to anoint me to this position, to to take me and to use me. C.S. Lewis once said, God draws straight lines with crooked sticks. You're that crooked stick. Guess what? He can still use you, and He wants to use you for His glory. But you first must encounter His holiness, and it leaves you completely and utterly humbled. When you look at all the sins in your life, and you realize there's no way that I should even be allowed to worship this God, let alone to serve Him. And yet you are totally humbled, but you see Him and you see what He's doing in your life and you believe. I believe, therefore I spoke. Abraham believed the Lord and it was counted to him for righteousness. In believing, you receive everything that you need to then begin influencing others, to drawing others closer to Christ. Quote, on a cold, dark winter morning, a soldier rode out of his encampment and noticed a group of his comrades desperately trying to put a log on the top of a wall they were building. Each time they attempted it, the beam fell. The men were exhausted and ready to give up. The only thing stopping them from throwing in the towel was a corporal who was barking orders at them. The soldier asked the noncommissioned officer why he didn't lend a hand. Don't you see I'm a corporal? He answered, not realizing who he was talking to. Without saying a word, the soldier dismounted and helped the infantrymen put the timber in place. He then told the men that if they needed any assistance again, just send for him their commander-in-chief, who, of course, was George Washington. Humility is the natural outflow of a deep encounter and continued encountering with God. It has to begin there. You see that? aspect, even in, the, even in the secular realm, so to speak, of humility in a leader like George Washington. It says that all of his troops loved him so much. That's why they followed him to the death, right? Why did they love him? He was a humble man. He was a great man, but he was a humble man. But humility must also be paired with faith, which is where the vision and courage of the leader begins. Believing something so strongly that not only are you willing to die for it, but you are actually willing to lead others to their death for it as well. If a gunman busts in here and says, if you believe in God, I'm going to kill you, do you? I'm going to answer for you, yes. And if if you don't want me to do that, (laughs) you must be not only willing to go to your own death, but even to lead others to their own death. The number one reason I've seen pastors quit the ministry is that they stop believing faith. They stop believing what they used to believe about God. And the number one reason that I've, I've seen pastors asked to leave is because of a lack of humility. But it plagues all believers at all levels. Um, even two weeks ago, after, after we had spoken at a church, pastor was asked to leave. Number two, the means of spiritual leadership, which are the presence of God 
and faithfulness to His Word. So this is, this is, these are the tools. This is how it's going to happen. This is how spiritual leadership or influence is going to flow out of your life um, into, into pushing someone closer to Christ. And I want to be careful with this kind of leadership and influence language. I don't, I don't want you to get a secular conception of this. You know, there's, there's, there's you know, Dale Carnegie and all of his ideas and whatever, that stuff, right? This has nothing to do with that. This is the power of God. Joshua 1.7. This is the Lord speaking to Joshua. And he says, Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. First of all, he says in verse 7, be careful to obey everything that's there. Meditate on it. This book has to guide you, in other words. And then he says, number two, in verse 9, the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. The Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. So it is the Word of God and the presence of God that are going to carry Joshua forward on this mission he's on and give him that success, right? Give him that, it says, you'll you'll prosper and succeed. In other words, in the spiritual mission and the commission that I have given to you, right? If the Lord has called you to do some ministry, whether that's, you know, teaching a three-year-old the Bible or whether it's evangelizing a coworker, He Himself is going to give you the resources to do that, Word and Spirit. Those are the two things that you need. The powerful presence of God, mediated through His Spirit, by the way, and faithfulness to His Word are the two methods that must be adhered to at all costs, Word and Spirit. Imagine that you're uh, snow skiing or water skiing, right? You're out there, and you look down at the brand of, your bo- of both of your skis from a different brand. The one says Word on it, the other one says Spirit. And you know that if you lose one of those skis, you're not going to stay up very long, you know? Now, I know professionals can, but I'm talking about you, right? Mm-hmm. And me. Uh, you're not going to last very long, right? You need both of those things. And that's how some believers and groups of believers are. They tend to emphasize the Spirit over here with the neglect of the Word. Others tend to emphasize the Word to the neglect of the Spirit. But you always need both. This is what John Calvin says about that. Therefore, let us hear no more of the fanatics who make the excuse of the Spirit to reject external teaching. For we must preserve the balance which Luke established here, that we obtain nothing from the hearing of the Word alone without the grace of the Spirit. And that the Spirit is conferred on us, not that He may produce contempt of the Word, but rather to instill confidence in it in our minds and write it on our hearts. Uh, His commentary on uh, the Acts of the Apostles. He's uh, talking about the Word and the Spirit. They must both complement each other. They always always do complement each other. You just sometimes leave one off. So here Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 1, 4, and 5, For we know, brothers loved by God, that He has chosen you, because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. Word and spirit according to Paul. If you're missing one of those things, you are not going to make it. I will tell you right now, you are not going to make it. He also tells him to meditate on the word day and night. God says to Joshua, he tells him a direct message. Meditate on this book of the law, the scriptures, in other words, day and night. I have a question for you. Do you do that? Do you think that God wants you to do that? That is a a convicting point even to me, day and night. Wow. You You mean it's supposed to be so prevalent in my life that it's there when it's light and even when it's dark? And to meditate on it? Do you know what it means to meditate on Scripture? To soak it into your soul? To think about it? 
to think about its implications for your life. You know, there's, there's no magic formula, okay? This is, this is God we're talking about here. And you can add many other things to, this, to these concepts, but this is what's here in Joshua. His presence and His Word are absolutely essential. God is the answer Himself to all of your problems. And if you don't believe that, then there's no hope for you because that's the gospel. It's the gospel of God. He Himself is our salvation. You know, and I guess this morning, it's, it's a little bit ironic because <laughs> I want to encourage you by discouraging you. I want to encourage you by discouraging you. I want to discourage you from trying to do anything in your own strength, from trying to do ministry in the flesh. And you know, that happens a lot, trying to do ministry in the flesh. You're not in the Word, in the Spirit, but you're in the flesh. I want to discourage you from that. It's not going to work. You need God Himself who is pushing you forward. And then he's using you to lead others closer to himself as well, right? Number three, the reality of spiritual leadership is strength and courage. In other words, what does it actually look like? What does it actually look like? Let's look at Joshua 1, 1 through 6. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I am about to give them to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon and from the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country, to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you, which is repeated in Hebrews 13, 5. Be strong and courageous, because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. You see, when we understand that, you know, the things that God was trying to teach Joshua were embodied and carried out by the person of the Lord Jesus. And now that you are in Christ, He is trying through His Word to teach you the same things. Paul says that all Scripture, right? He doesn't say some of Scripture. He says all Scripture is useful for rebuking, correcting, training, teaching and training in righteousness, right? 2 Timothy 3, all of Scripture. He's trying to teach you the same things that he was trying to teach Joshua. They're embodied in the Lord Jesus, and now in Christ, as you are, you can live these things out in His power. But strength and courage are the two hallmarks of what leadership looks like on the ground. There's sometimes a false image of spiritual leadership or of um, servant leadership that is portrayed sometimes where you're sort of a weakling. You're sort of you're only meek, but no, there's no courage, and that's that's not proper either. There should be strength. There should be courage. You know, people people should want to do the kind of things you're doing. In Second Samuel 23, it says this: These are the names of the mighty men whom David had: Josheb, Bathshebeth, a, a Tekemenite. He was chief of the three. He wielded his spear against 800, whom he killed at one time. Really? And next to him, among the three mighty men, was Eliezer, the son of Dodo, son of Ahohi. He was with David when they defied the Philistines who were gathered there for battle. And the men of Israel withdrew. He rose and struck down the Philistines until his hand was weary and his hand clung to the sword. They couldn't even open up his fingers. And the Lord brought about a great victory that day, and the men returned after him only to strip the slain. And next to him was Shema, the son of Agi, the Hararite. The Philistines gathered together at Lehi, where there was a plot of ground full of lentils, and the men fled from the Philistines. But he took his stand in the midst of the plot, the field, and defended it and struck down the Philistines. And the Lord worked a great victory. And three of the thirty chief men went down and came about harvest time to David at the cave of Adullam, when a band of Philistines was encamped in the valley of Rephaim. 
David was then in the stronghold, and the garrison of the Philistines was then at Bethlehem. And David said longingly, Oh, that someone would give me water to drink from the well of Bethlehem that is by the gate. Then the three, just three, mighty men broke through the camp of the Philistines and drew water out of the well of Bethlehem that was by the gate and carried it and brought it to David. But he would not drink of it. He poured it out to the Lord, humility, and said, Far be it from me, O Lord, that I should do this. Shall I drink the blood of the men who went at the risk of their lives? Therefore he would not drink it. These things the three mighty men did. Now Abishai, the brother of Joab, the son of Zariah, was chief of the thirty. And he wielded his sword against three hundred men and killed them and won a name beside the three. He was the most renowned of the thirty and became their commander, but he did not attain to the three. And Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, was a valiant man of Kabzeel, a doer of great deeds. <laughs> he struck down two aerials of Moab. He also went down and struck down a lion in a pit on a day when the snow had fallen. And he struck down an Egyptian, a handsome man. The Egyptian had a spear in his hand, but Benaiah went down to him with a staff and snatched the spear out of the Egyptian's hand and killed him with his own spear. These things did Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, and won a name beside the three mighty men. He was renowned among the thirty, but he did not attain to the three, and David set him over his bodyguard. These are called the mighty men. In Hebrew, it's one word, giborim, the mighty men of old who served alongside of David. You know, how, how was he able to withstand Saul and his entire army the time he was in the desert with, with these guys? That's how. They were the mighty men of old. They were awesome warriors for the kingdom of God. They believed in David's cause. The Giborim did many mighty deeds. You can read about even Deborah became a military general. In Jael, another woman drove a stake through the pagan commander Sisera's head. Her name means mountain goat. Wow, I believe it. I mean, I, I mean, you know, even their women were more brave than our men today. Where is the strength and courage? This phrase, be strong and courageous, occurs at least 11 times in the Bible. That is, that is from a vocabulary perspective, very significant. Be strong and courageous. I want you to think about a tree that gets planted next to a river like the cottonwoods that are here in Utah, a, a hardwood that grows up strong and unshakable, like it says in Psalm 1, blessed is the man who does not sit in the counsel of the, uh, stand in the counsel of the wicked or sit in the seat of mockers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law he meditates both day and night. It says he's like a tree that's planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. Why? Because it's next to the stream. These streams are what God supplies. He gives the strength to grow into what he has for us. And that is absolutely necessary. But it's strong. And we can be strong and courageous in the work of the Lord. We can take initiative. God doesn't want you to sit back at work. He wants you to take initiative. He doesn't want you to just sit there and watch your kids grow up and be influenced by the world. He wants you to take initiative. Husbands, he wants you to take initiative to sanctify and lead your family. The same could go for the elders of this church and me as pastor, other church leaders in the areas here. All these different areas where we should influence people to draw nearer to the Lord Jesus. He wants you to take initiative in strength and encourage and to not give up, no matter how hard it becomes. George Whitfield once said, I would rather wear out than rust out. Now, what's the final effect of spiritual leadership? Where does it get you? What's, what's the beautiful picture that it's painting? I put it this way, the kingdom expanded in us and us in the kingdom. <laughs> what do I mean by that? When, when Joshua succeeded and the Lord gave him success, he led the people into the promised land, into the kingdom of God, right? He was able to get them to their destination, in other words. He got the job done. But you notice the generation that follows Joshua, it says all of them were faithful to the Lord, that whole generation. So the kingdom, <laughs> they not only got into the kingdom, <laughs> but apparently the kingdom had gotten into them, right? That's my goal for you. I want to lead you into the kingdom. Great. If you're a non-believer, I want to lead you to Christ, but it's Christ in you, the hope of glory. I want Christ to be expanded in your heart. So, in other words, what that looks like is you advance the kingdom of God, and the kingdom of God advances in you. 
So you lead others into it, but it also grows in you as well. You, you grow and you lead others to grow as well. So it says finally toward the end, Joshua 23. Joshua is now, they're in the land. They've more or less had success in taking a lot of territory. He's giving some of the final words to all this generation of warriors. Be very strong, he says, Joshua 23, 6. Be careful to obey all that is written in the book of the law of Moses. Now he's passing it on. Without turning aside to the right or to the left, do not associate with these nations that remain among you. Do not invoke the names of their gods or swear by them. You must not serve them or bow down to them, but you are to hold fast to the Lord your God and as you have until now. The Lord has driven out before you great and powerful nations to this day. No one has been able to withstand you. One of you routes a thousand, just like the mighty men, right? Because the Lord your God fights for you, just as He promised. So be very careful to love the Lord your God. But some of you are still trying to do it in the flesh. You're still trying to do it in your own strength, and it's not going to work. It has to be the Lord that fights for you. The kingdom gets expanded, and you go into the kingdom, and it gets expanded in your own heart. It gets the job done, and they get where they're going. There has to be a tangible effect of that leadership, right? Don Juan Chang, who founded Forever 21, a popular clothing company, said this, $4 billion company a year. Many people would expect I would be praying for something big, but that's not the case. I pray, he was talking about his prayer life, I pray for my personal life, my business, and I just talk to God like a friend. When I was in L.A., I used to always go to church at 5 a.m., to pray and start my day. He prints uh, John 3.16 on all the bags that uh, you would take out of Forever 21. You go to in and out you have fries, you look at the bottom, there's scripture verses printed there. There Many examples of Christian leaders who are trying to use what they have to influence others for Christ. And guess what? It it, it works. People have been saved. People have been converted. It's, It's having effect on people's lives. I know an incredible um, contractor, a guy who was a builder, had a big company, and he would gather together all of his workers, all the construction workers in the warehouse every single morning for a devotional, (laughs) you know? Every single morning, he was preaching the gospel to all these guys, you know? Unconverted construction workers were getting more church than you do. Why? Because they had a spiritual general as a boss. It was incredible, he was having so much influence. This guy was not a pastor, but he was exerting that influence of the Spirit and of the Word upon these people's lives, leading them to Christ. He saw a lot of fruit, too. Spiritual leadership gets the job done, takes initiative, but from proper motivation and using proper means. You know, I love each and every one of you, and I guess what I'm trying to say this morning is not so much that, that I want to be a leader, but that I want to empower you to be leaders who lead others closer to Christ. Moms, isn't this what you want to do with your children? Isn't it what we all want to do at our workplace and in our community as well? Christ himself has led the way in his life, death and resurrection. And sacrifice was the climactic mark of his leadership, which also must be the highest aim that we aspire to as well. Greater love has no one than this, Jesus said, that he would lay down his life for his friends. Paul said he was willing to be cut off for the sake of his brethren, right? Wow. He also said the love of Christ compels me. Paul must have felt as though he was very loved to be able to do what he did. So you have to receive the sacrificial love of Christ first and foremost before you can sacrificially lead others to Christ. Can I say that again? You have to first receive the sacrificial love of Christ before you can sacrifice in love to lead others close to him. If you're a non-believer here this morning, that's exactly what you need, the sacrificial love of Christ for your soul. And you'll never go anywhere spiritually until you first receive that, have that encounter with God. It leads to faith and humility. Everything else flows out of that. Then God himself will use you to lead others closer to Christ. God himself will use you to lead others closer to Christ. Amen.